Welcome to the last A Push video review. Yay! This one's on political parties. As always, remember that you need to take thorough handwritten notes on the handout provided. In the early days of the constitutional government, um, politicians warned against political parties. Um, Madison wrote in the Federalist Papers number 10, remember the Federalist Papers were written in support of ratifying the Constitution, especially in New York. Um, and Madison um, wrote that to be wary of factions. And then Washington tried to avoid uh, political, political party issues throughout his presidency. And um, in his farewell address, along with advocating not getting into longstanding political alliances um, with other countries, he also talked about developing political alliances and factions within our own country and that that could be dangerous, especially if political parties developed with certain regional interests that it would drive the nation apart. However, we didn't really listen to Washington and Madison, and the first party system developed pretty much at the beginning of um, the constitutional government, um, kind of stemming from the from the Federalist, Anti-Federalist discussion that went on during the ratification of the Constitution. And the first two parties were the Federalist and the Democratic Republicans. The Federalist platform or ideals were, first of all, that they believed in the supremacy of the federal government, that the federal government had more power than the states. Um, and they were loose interpreters of the Constitution. They believe that um, whatever the Constitution didn't forbid, it allowed. Um, they were generally pro-industry and pro-business, um, and therefore, because they wanted to promote industry and business, they also were pro-British. They supported the Bank of the United States and often were considered elitist. The supporters of the Federalist Party were... Um, people in the Northeast, especially those associated with the market economy. Um, and the major Federalists, the most important Federalists, were Alexander Hamilton, Chief Justice John Marshall, and the only Federalist President, John Adams, who appointed John Marshall as the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. The Democratic Republicans, their platform or beliefs were that they believed in the supremacy of the states, that the that whatever power was not given to the federal government expressly in the Constitution was given to the states, and they believed in a strict interpretation of the Constitution. If the Constitution didn't say it, then you couldn't do it. Um, Jefferson was the leading Democratic Republican, and he believed in a nation that was run by farmers, that in an agrarian society, and that we would produce raw materials and trade those for finished goods from other countries. And so he believed in, in the importance of the farmer and the country serving um, the agrarian lifestyle. And therefore, he was against policies that supported business and he didn't like the Bank of the United States. He felt it was unconstitutional because the Constitution didn't say you could do it. And um, the Democratic Republicans tended to be pro-French, um, stemming from the treaty we had with them during the Revolutionary War. Um, and the pro-French, pro British issue led to a lot of debate um, because the British and the French were at war during that time and so it led to um, a lot of debate over which side we should be on and the issue of neutrality. Um, supporters of the Democratic Republican Party were generally farmers, um, southerners, and pretty much anybody else not involved in the market system. So for example, um, Artisans were often supporters of the Democratic Republican Party because they didn't like um, industry running them out of business. Uh, Thomas Jefferson is the leading Democratic Republican. James Madison and James Monroe were also Democratic Republicans or Republicans. The second party system developed around 1836. 
1824, the Federalist Party had pretty much died out. So everybody running for president was a member of the Democratic Republican Party or kind of the the remainder of that party. Um, and there are five people running, and no one wanted to settle on one candidate. So what happened was that it went to the voters, and then no one got a majority of the electoral votes, so it went to the House of Representatives, and that led to the corrupt bargain, and John Quincy Adams becoming president, and Jackson was angry, and blah, 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 blah. You remember that story. Um, during this time, the party became incre increasingly divided um, over issues like states' rights, largely about abolition, and then economic policy. Were they pro-business? Were they pro-farmer? And so eventually a two-party system develops from that. Um, the Democratic-Republican Party kind of evolves into the Democratic Party or Jacksonian democracy. The second party system is the Democrats and then the Whigs develop as a rebellion against the Democratic Party. Um, support for both parties during this period was fairly balanced, so that meant that the elections were close and that voter turnout was high. As I mentioned before, the Democratic Party uh, is heavily influenced by Jefferson and the Democratic Republican Party, and it's really seen as the party of Jackson. Democrats pretty much took the same ideas as Jefferson, like the supremacy of the state over the federal government, um, the idea of serving the common man. Um, Jackson kind of changes it to the common man rather than the farmer, um, but kind of the same ideas of the regular guy, um, the basic working American rather than the elites that the Federalist Party would serve. Um, Things do change a bit in that Jackson also ad advocates for, for the Democratic platform a strong executive power, meaning that the executive, whether it be the governor or the president, has more power um, and is, is in charge of Congress. Um, the Democratic Party also supported territorial expansion and cheap sale of federal land at, to the common man, basically. And the idea was to benefit the average man that he could own land. Um, also, Indian removal was a big part of the Democratic platform, um, moving Native Americans west of the Mississippi. And this was supposedly to help the Native Americans so that they could preserve their culture, but it also helps the average farmer because it opens up more land for them and um, takes away the threat of Native Americans. Um, Democrats are against positive intervention by the government in banks and corporations. They feel that um, giving money and special policies to banks and corporations violates people's individual rights because not everybody is getting this help from the government. Democrats also don't really like protective tariffs. Um, they don't like subsidies for internal improvements like roads and canals or any kind of privilege for wealthy people. They also do not support women in politics, and this is going to have a lot to do with their demographics um, because their demographics are the Deep South where patriarchy is strong, um, Western states, which would probably be okay with women being involved. Um, and then you have strong supporters in Virginia, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, New Hampshire, and Maine. And again, these are going to be people that um, are either farmers or artisans, people that don't benefit from the market economy. Presidents that were Democrats during this second party system were Jackson, Van Buren, Polk, Pierce, and Buchanan. Um, the Democrats are also going to appeal strongly, like you see the um, New York, New Jersey um, appeal there. A lot of that's going to be immigrants, um, Catholic immigrants especially, um, 
who support the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party is not going to be as big into um, abolition and the rights of free blacks as the Whigs are because their supporters, Southern whites, and immigrants are going to feel threatened by that. Um, immigrants are competing or would compete with free blacks for jobs, and so slavery is of benefit to them. The Democratic Party splits in 1856 due to disagreement over the Kansas-Nebraska Act. The Democratic Party remains, but during the period of the Civil War, um, there's those in the North who support abolition and those in the South who do not, and they do not elect a president again until 1844. The Whig Party was formed in opposition to Andrew Jackson. The people that formed the party didn't like Andrew Jackson's opposition to the Bank of the United States, and they saw him as giving himself too much executive power and an abuse of the, of the presidency. Um, in fact, they named the Whig Party after a party during revolutionary times that opposed King George. And so they're trying to bring in revolutionary imagery and paint Andrew Jackson as a monarch and often nicknamed him King Andrew. Um, the Whig Party at the beginning was more of just kind of a rebellion against Andrew Jackson and the the ideals to the Democratic Party were fairly similar and in fact some of the people that originally formed the Whig Party like John C. Calhoun were just angry at Jackson he was angry about his his belief that Jackson was abusing executive power because of the nullification crisis um, and, but eventually, he ended up returning to the Democratic Party. However, others stayed with the Whig Party and began to develop um, a separate ideology. And a lot of the Whig ideology can be traced to the Federalist ideology, um, such as the belief in national policies and the supremacy of the federal government over state governments. Um, they believed in regulating personal behavior or supported policies, which the Democrats didn't, such as the temperance movement. They supported the Bank of the United States and the American system, which were to build the national economy through roads and canals and tariffs and a banking system and coining of money. Um, they opposed territorial expansion. And the idea there is that territorial expansion will lead to a debate over whether the territories can be free or slave states. And that will lead to um, a lot of tension and kind of a, a regional issues rather than national issues and could lead to violence. And so it's better just to avoid the whole conversation um, by not expanding. Um, they also believe in allowing women to be involved, not in voting, because women can't vote at that time, but in political meetings. Um, that, and this is largely because they appeal to um, the middle class. And during the Second Great Awakening, middle class women had been called to be the moral leaders of their family and to be involved in issues such as abolition and temperance. So they were brought into political meetings to be the moral leaders in those political meetings. Um, and that is pretty much the Whig philosophy. Whig supporters were mostly in the Northeast and those associated with the market economy. Um, also, anybody who opposed strong executive power, at least in the beginning, also belonged to the Whig party. Presidents that were Whigs were Harrison, and then Harrison died very soon after taking office, so then Tyler took over, and then Taylor was also elected on the Whig platform. The Whig party died in 1852. Um, it had been led by Henry Clay and Daniel Webster, both who passed away in 1852, interestingly enough. Um, the significance of the Whig Party is that in a time when 
the country was heavily divided by sectional issues. They upheld the concept of union, of the nation, of keeping the country together. You had a third party that developed during this second party system known as the Free Soil Party. And they were wanted more from the Democrats and the Whigs. They, they wanted a stronger abolition stance. Um, and what they wanted was to ban slavery in the territories. And during the 1840 election, they ended up taking votes from the Democrats and gave Tyler a victory for the Whig Party. Um, the most important thing about the Free Soil Party, though, is that the Free Soil Party and several other parties end up joining together to form the Republican Party. The Know Nothing Party was another third party that developed during the second party system. Uh, they were anti-immigrant because of all the new immigrants coming into the country at that time. Um, they wanted to increase the naturalization period for immigrants, and they also wanted to ban immigrants from public office. Um, they took votes away from the Democratic Party, um, but quickly split over the issue of slavery. Take a little break here from the political parties for a second. This is my early Mother's Day win in my family. Um, Cade brought this home the other day from school, and I said, Cade, what does it say? And because you can see I, he has some interesting spelling choices here. And it says, my mom is the best at, he said, driving. And I guess he just wanted to drive, draw a car because I have no idea. I'm not a good great driver. I'm not like a race car person or whatever. So I looked at him and I was like, I'm the best at driving? And he's like, well, yeah, better than daddy. When? The third party system from 1854 to 1890s. The Democrats and Republicans are the two parties in this third party system. It is known, the system, for close elections, like the last one, and high voter turnout. Um, another big deal during this period is the spoils system and the political machine becomes very important. The spoils system is something that had always been around, um, but then Jackson develops further into you get your job because you're loyal to a party. And you, and you don't get to keep your job until you die or decide to retire, as had been the policy under the first party system. Jackson changes it so that when there's a regime change, the major positions in the bureaucracy overturn as well, and you give those who have been loyal to your party jobs. And this continues during the third party system. The political machine becomes very important in both parties because of the changing economy, the growth of urban areas, and the growth of immigration. Um, there's, this is something the country had never encountered, and therefore the government didn't have a lot of policies or systems to take care of problems that came up in urbanization and immigration. And so the political party decided to take care of that. Um, they would meet people at, at, at Ellis Island or wherever they were being processed as immigrants and help them find a home and help them find a job and take care of people when they got sick, reward people um, for political loyalty with political jobs and patronage and things such as that. So the political machine was quite important during this time period. Um, the Republican Party was also really important during this time period. The Republicans only won in 1884 and 1892, and both times it was Grover Cleveland who was elected. The Democratic platform is fairly similar to what it was in the last time period, um, except that you have Northern Democrats and Southern Democrats. And Southern Democrats are going to be more supportive of segregation policies and states' rights. Northern Democrats are not necessarily as concerned with those issues. Um, 
imperialism becomes an issue towards the end of this period, and Democrats are going to be less supportive of imperialism than Republicans are. Supporters of Democrats during this third political party system are the urban working class and poor, immigrants, southern whites, and then anybody else not served by pro-banking and business policies. Um, in New York, Indiana, New Jersey, and Connecticut, the support between Democrats and Republicans is fairly balanced. Um, the only president from the Democratic Party elected during this time period is Grover Cleveland, and he won um, in 1884, and then he was there was a Democratic president in between, and then he was elected again. Um, in 1876 and 1888, the Democrats won the popular vote, but they did not end up winning the electoral vote. In 1876, that was the Taze, the Hayes-Tilden election, <coughs> where um, they made the bargain that Hayes would become president if um, the Republicans would agree to end radical reconstruction and pull the military out of the South and guarantee Southern political positions um, in the federal government and give money to the rebuilding of the South. The Republican Party formed at the end of the antebellum period. Um, they took up a lot of the supporters from the Whig Party that fell apart. Um, the Democratic Party was had split, and so some Democrats went over to the Republican Party, and then there was third-party anti-slavery groups um, that also joined in to create the Republican Party. And the significant thing about the Republican Party is that it is a truly regional party at this time. It at the, Annabelle, at the end of the antebellum period, there's zero support in the South for the Republican Party. And even during this time period, um, during the third political party system, there's still very little support in the South for the Republicans. The platform of the Republican Party is fairly similar to the Whigs. They are going to be more the pro-business, um, pro-market, nationalistic, party. Um, they are more supportive of imperialism than the Democrats are, and they are more supportive of immigration reform. And what I mean by immigration reform is that they want to limit uh, immigration. Supporters of the Republican Party lived in the North and the West and usually were supporters of business and banking. Farmers in the North and West and artisans generally supported um, the Democratic Party. Also, until their voting rights were stripped from them after radical reconstruction, Southern blacks were also supporters of the Republican Party. There was ballot support for Republican in New York, Indiana, New Jersey, and Connecticut. Republican presidents were Lincoln, Grant, Garfield, Harrison, and McKinley. The Populist Party formed as a third party um, during this period because they felt like neither side was really doing a good job of representing the farmers. Um, and something that I remember seeing with essays um, during this period was that a a lot of you were confused about who these populists were, and you really associated farming with the South. And while some Southerners were supporters of the Populist Party, a lot of what is meant by farmers and the issues of the Populist Party are actually Western issues. Um, so like Kansas, Nebraska, um, Wyoming, Oregon, that sort of... all issues for those people as well as the South. Um, the populist party platform was that they wanted the free coinage of silver. Um, they wanted popular election of senators. Um, they wanted to nationalize the railroads, the telephone, and the telegraph companies. Um, they wanted a graduated income tax. And they wanted reform of the bank 
tax um, to get better loan rates um, for farmers. The Populist Party gained some support and, and did okay in the election of 1892, but by 1896, um, William Jennings Bryan made his famous um, Cross of Gold speech at the Democratic Convention and ended up getting the Democratic nomination. And after that, you know, the populist had to decide what's more important, the party or the ideals. Um, and so since the Democratic Party had kind of adopted the populist ideals, the party kind of died out. The most important thing about the populist party is that everything I just listed in terms of their platform was actually adopted and put into law by the progressives in the next 20 years. The fourth party system develops in 1896 and lasts until the New Deal in 1932. The fourth party system um, is still the Democrats and the Republicans. However, both parties during this period are championing progressive reforms. During this period, they're going to weaken the boss system. Um, issues are also going to target urban voters um, rather than rural issues. Um, the election of 1896 was really the last time that they tried to, um, that any party tried to win the election based on the ideals of an agrarian society. Um, and you see both parties starting to see the government in some role as an agency of human welfare, that they need to take care of the people um, and protect them. The Democrats during this period have a fairly similar platform to the one they've always had um, with more progressive leanings. Um, they also have similar supporters. The president that's elected as a Democrat during the progressive era is Woodrow Wilson. The Republicans also have a fairly similar platform to the previous time period. Um, they are heavily involved in progressive reforms under the presidency of Teddy Roosevelt. However, under Taft, they start to have a more pro-business leaning and are less involved um, with the whole progressive movement. Um, they have similar supporters to the time period before. Teddy Roosevelt, Taft, Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover are all presidents for the Republican Party during this time period. Republicans in the 1920s totally turned their backs on the progressive movement. Um, during the 20s, all the presidents are Republicans. And what they want after the World War is a return to normalcy. They don't want any kind of reforms. They want to have American success. They want to they go back to promoting big business again, and they move away from the progressive policies. Um, in fact, you have a court um, where most of the justices are promoted by these 1920s Republicans. Um, it's led by former President Taft, and they undo a great deal of the progressive legislation that was passed in the first 20 years of the 20th century. During this time, you see several third parties that form. One is the Progressive Party, which was formed in 1912. President Teddy Roosevelt, um, he had only, he had served as president when McKinley died, and then he had been elected in 1904. And he had promised in 1904 when he was elected that he wouldn't run again. So he doesn't run in 1908, um, and Taft becomes president. And during Taft's presidency, um, he becomes very pro-business and kind of goes against the ideals of Roosevelt and, and what he thought were the ideals of the Republican Party. So Roosevelt is very disenchanted, and so in 1912 decides to create his own party, which is more focused on um, progressive reforms, not the, the business side um, of the party, um, and ends up taking votes from the Republicans, and Wilson, a Democrat, ends up getting elected. And because votes are split between Roosevelt and um, Taft during the election, Roosevelt doesn't win. The Socialist Party also makes a decent showing on the ballot in 1912. Um, socialism was growing in popularity all over the world as a, re as a response to 
the growing urban industrial society. Um, so it makes sense that it would catch on to some degree in the United States, especially during a period of backlash against um, corporations and banking in the United States. Eugene Debs, who had been a labor leader, was exposed to the idea of socialism when he was jailed for um, leading labor strikes and violating um, Supreme Court orders to stop. Um, and so he creates the Socialist Party. During the 1912 election, they have the most successful showing for socialists in an election in the United States. However, socialism doesn't really catch on in the United States. And according to Sombeer, who is a, a German po a political scientist, um, these were his ideas about why. That society wasn't about... Um, having titles in the Americas, it was fairly egalitarianism, or egalitarian, so people felt more equal. Um, that if you were having a terrible time living in the city, that you could, and, and industrialization was getting you down, that you could move west and find other opportunities that... Um, that there were other opportunities besides being beaten down by the urban industrial system. Um, that workers in the United States had a fairly high standard of living as compared to other workers um, in industrial societies. And that every, most people in the United States had the right to vote. Um, so workers, even though they were not being treated well, they could express their displeasure through through voting and through who they elected, where that wasn't the case in Europe. I know you're tired. We're almost done. Only one more party system to go. Here's a little break, a little Cade. This is the other day before his first baseball game of the season. He was very excited. The fifth party system begins in 1933 with the New Deal Coalition and arguably continues to present day. Some argue it ended in 1968, and some argue it ended in 1980, and we'll discuss why momentarily. In 1933, you have a shift in party support due to Roosevelt's New Deal, or the New Deal Coalition. The Democratic platform that you see in 1933 is going to be a little different than Democratic platforms in the past, and you're also going to see some evolution over the years in, in what they generally support. But overall, what you see is the creation of what's called American liberalism. And Democrats tend to support a bigger federal government, which is different than Democrats in the past, who had often been um, more supportive of states' rights, um, but they had liked executive power. But now what you're seeing is that they believe in more programs that makes the government bigger. Um, a lot of those have to do with social welfare, like social security, um, unemployment, health care. Um, and those issues have fluctuated over the years as to what's really important. Um, and some programs have gone away. Some programs have sustained themselves over the years. Um, civil rights and um, affirmative action, um, depending on the time period, are also going to be um, important ideals of American liberalism. Supporters of the Democratic Party under the New Deal coalition were white Southerners, ethnic and religious constituencies, and this wasn't a change in terms of Catholics because of an some of them had been immigrants, and now, of course, they've lived in the country for a long time, but traditionally they supported the Democratic Party. Some are new immigrants as well. Jews are supportive of the Democratic Party. And then a switch um, in the time period is that African Americans began largely voting Democratic. In the past, they had been big supporters of the Republican Party because it was the party of Lincoln. But as the Republican Party becomes more pro-big business, that's not really going to benefit the African American very much. And so they see the New Deal policies as being more beneficial to them. 
Labor unions are very supportive of the Democratic Party. Urban political machines, um, progressive intellectuals, and then populist farm groups. So they all come together to get Roosevelt elected in 1932. Um, presidents that are from the Democratic Party in the 20th century are FDR, Truman, JFK, LBJ, Carter, Clinton, and Obama. In 1948, you see a split in the Democratic Party. Um, the Dixiecrat Party becomes a third party um, in the South, and what they support is states' rights. And what they don't like about the Democratic Party is that they've been more supportive of civil rights. Truman, at this point, has just supported the integration of the military. Um, and they're talking about adding civil rights elements to the party platform. And this is not something that's supported by Southern Democrats. Um, so they don't want Truman's name on the 1948 ballot in the South. So they have to create another party in order to put another candidate on the ballot. They don't really have that huge of a success and Truman ends up getting elected, although at first they don't think he will and that Dewey will win, but Truman ends up prevailing. Um, but this becomes a sign that the, the Southern support for the Democratic Party is wavering. You also see division in the Democratic Party in 1968. This is largely due to Vietnam and the conflict over hawks and doves. And generally, the Democratic Party, um, up until Clinton, is seen as being very, is more on the dove side of things. Um, but Clinton begins to change the idea, the new Democrat, the new liberal, um, and begins to be more involved in, in foreign policy and military action. Um, the American Independent Party is created during this time period um, by George Wallace. And uh, again, what he's upset about, states' rights, he's pro-segregation, um, but he has a big appeal to the urban working class, again, because they're, they're threatened by African Americans getting more rights um, and the attention that's being given to the civil rights movement um, and not to their plight. Um, and, of course, they're going to appeal to Southerners. They don't have much showing again, um, but it does mark a, a split in the Democratic Party, and this leaves room. The platform of the Republican Party since 1933 has continued to be pro-business. Um, however, they've changed a little bit in their approach to the federal-state relationship. They believe the federal government is still important but you see Republicans advocating states' rights more than Democrats at this point. Um, Republicans are also going to argue that the federal government is getting too big, and a lot of the things that used to be the state's job are now being taken on by the federal government. Um, they want to limit, if not do away, with some of the welfare programs that have been created over the years. Um, some welfare programs they don't want to eliminate because those are entrenched, and some presidents are more supportive, Republican presidents have been more supportive of welfare programs than others. But overall, they like to see those limited. Um, the Republican Party since Reagan, um, but kind of started under Nixon, has also been seen as, as more involved in conservative um, moral issues. Um, and supporting those as well. The supporters of the Republican Party have typically been northern and western middle class people and those who support business and banking um, and those people who want a smaller, less powerful federal government. Presidents include Eisenhower, Nixon, Ford, Reagan, George H.W. Bush, and George W. Bush. For in the 1980s, you have the neoconservative movement, and you have, again, the Reagan coalition, or um, uh, some shifts in voter demographics. Um, white Southern voters, after 1980, 
tend to vote Republican more than Democratic. And before 1980, white Southern voters tended to vote Democratic more than they voted Republican. So you see a permanent shift there. Um, and that had really begun in 1948. It happened in 1960. Um, Nixon won the South in 1972, but th those were temporary um, shifts, but this is a permanent shift after 1980. Um, you see a temporary shift as well in the working class Democrats, especially um, northern urban working class Democrats who um, liked Reagan's social policies and his foreign policy. Um, they vote Republican in 80 and 84, but not so much in 88. And by 1992, Clinton is able to win them back with his new Democrat um, ideals. In 1992, a third party candidate emerged named H. Ross Perot. And H. Ross Perot had, was from Texas, never been a politician before, but decides to declare one night on the Larry King show that you know, he would run for president and enough people showed support for that. And the whole idea was that he was not a career politician, um, that he had been a successful businessman, and that the economy was in trouble, that we had this huge debt, um, and that as a successful businessman, he was the most qualified to turn around the American economy. Um, and this idea of the political outsider, the businessman, kind of appealed to a lot of voters who had become really disillusioned with the political system um, over the years. And so he's able to have a fairly decent showing in the 1992 election. And that concludes our political party review, and our views in general. Good luck on your AP test, and don't forget to turn in all of your notes. Nixon to win in 1968.